Hello, I'm Dr. Michael Kohler, and this is Thad, one of Loyola's standardized patients. The purpose of this video is to train first-year medical students on steps of the abdominal examination. And as a prelude to that, we'll also include the surface anatomy that's relevant to the abdominal exam. And of course, before any physical examination, uh, we always wash our hands, so I'm going to first wash my hands. <clears throat> As with any examination, the patient needs to be in the proper position. And to do an abdominal examination, the patient should be flat or supine. So Thad, if I can ask you to please lay back for me. So you as a physician need to make sure that the examining table is flat and that you pull out the shelf for their legs so they can lie flat. The exam examiner needs to also make sure that the uh, they ex properly expose the abdomen. So you always need a sheet as well as a gown. It's always best to ask the patient to uh, adjust the gown themselves. So Thad, if you could lift up your gown for me. Just a little bit higher, great. Now I've got good visualization of the abdomen here. We always ask patients to have their arms at their sides. They should not be uh, you know, above their head. Uh, if the patient's hands are above their head, that tenses up the skin and the muscles of the abdomen. And of course, the door should be shut in addition to, to draping. You as a physician should be on the patient's right side uh, to do this examination. So let's begin by looking at some of the surface markings of the abdominal wall. The costal margin is the lower border of cartilage uh, of ribs 7 to 10 anteriorly. While this is not the superior border of the abdomen, it is the bony prominence near the upper end of the abdomen. The xiphoid process is a finger-like projection from the body of the sternum in the midline. Also in the midline, there is a line known as the linea alba, which goes from the xiphoid process all the way down to the symphysis pubicis. You'll remember that line from your uh, anatomy class. Then if you could lift your head off, off the table, you'll notice there's contraction of uh, uh, the rectus abdominal muscles. These muscles run longitudinally from the lower margins of the uh, costal cartilage all the way down to the pubic bone and the symphysis pubis. They run approximately 7 to 10 centimeters uh, from the midline, and the lateral border of the rectus abdominal muscle is known as a linea semilunaris. Okay, you can put your head back, thanks. Also in the midline is the umbilicus. Uh, although it takes many different uh, shapes and structures, whether it's an innie or an outie, um, the location of the umbilicus depends on the patient's body habitus. Uh, for most people, the umbilicus is located at the level of the fourth lumbar vertebrae. However, depending on the patient's weight, their size, uh, and so forth, it can vary from L3 to 2L5. As we move inferiorly, the, the bony prominence of the uh, pubic bone is noted uh, in, the, in the midline. In the exact midline is a joint known as the symphysis pubis. Uh, it does not have um, a lot of movement, but there is an articulation there between the two pubic bones. As we move laterally, the bone is known as the pubic crest, and a little bit further lateral, about one inch out, there's a bony prominence known as the pubic tubercle. That bony prominence is important because that is the um, one of the points of reference for the inguinal ligament. As we move further laterally, you'll notice another bony prominence known as the anterior superior iliac spine. This is always easy to, to identify on any patient. Moving from the pubic tubercle to the anterior superior iliac spine is the inguinal ligament. As we move further from the anterior superior iliac spine, we can follow a bony prominence laterally, and that's known as the iliac crest. That iliac crest is a wing-like portion of the ilium bone, which sort of flares out laterally, and it goes superiorly and posteriorly. And if we were to feel uh, in back, it ends in what's known as the posterior superior iliac spine. There's four quadrants in the abdomen. That it, and we use these four quadrants as uh, reference points and as points of descriptions where we locate masses or where we identify physical findings. It's sort of an arbitrary 
horizontal line almost, if you will. It's an imaginary horizontal line that runs through the umbilicus, and the vertical line also runs uh, through the umbilicus. Um, so again, if we were to imagine those two lines over the abdomen, we would have the right upper quadrant, the right lower quadrant, the left lower quadrant, and then the left upper quadrant. The patient's abdomen, of course, does extend superiorly above the costal margin and actually extends all the way up to the uh, dome of the diaphragm. The location of the diaphragm does vary because as the muscle respiration, it elevates and lowers and elevates and lowers with each breath. With quiet respiration, there might only be a, approximately one centimeter movement up and down. But if a patient's exercising or taking deep breaths, that can vary as much as three to 10 centimeters up and down. On the right side, you could locate the, the roughly horizontal plane of the dome of the diaphragm at about the fourth rib in the midclavicular line. Let's talk about that. that. I'm just going to lift your gown up a little bit higher. The clavicle is a bone that runs from the sternal notch all the way laterally uh, to the shoulder. About midpoint of that clavicle, that would be the midclavicular line. For further reference to that uh, anatomical uh, landmark, I could refer you to the thorax training video where we go into much detail all of the uh, vertical lines around the axis of the chest. Let's move back down again um, to the inguinal ligament. As I said, that runs from the, the pubic tubercle laterally to the anterior superior iliac spine. Just above that inguinal ligament lies the inguinal canal which is approximately four centimeters long and runs above and parallel to the inguinal ligament. That is the site uh, of inguinal hernias. Also in this um, general area are the inguinal lymph nodes. And there's the superficial inguinal lymph nodes are divided into two groups. There's a horizontal group and a vertical group. The horizontal inguinal lymph nodes lies approximately one centimeter below the area of the inguinal uh, ligament and also parallel. So when an examiner places their fingers, finger pads on the skin, they'll be feeling below the inguinal ligament and doing short circular motion such as this to feel the horizontal superficial inguinal lymph nodes. The vertical superficial inguinal lymph nodes again lie below that inguinal ligament and somewhat medial to the femoral artery. First you need to identify the femoral artery pulse, which I think you can probably notice my fingertips moving back and forth. The vertical superficial inguinal lymph nodes cluster near the end of the greater saphenous vein. So moving just medially to the our femoral artery and going down is where I palpate for the vertical uh, superficial inguinal lymph nodes. And it's important to make that distinction of the horizontal and the vertical almost forming a T because they do drain separate areas of the body.